Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I should say that this performance is at the behest of Professor Kathy Green of the University of Denver. And she has asked me to say everything I know in 90 minutes and keep it clear and orderly. So I'm going to attempt to do that by using this pad of paper, which I carefully filled out uh, over the weekend, uh, on which I put everything that I know. However, whether I can make it all clear or not remains to be seen, and it may be that by and by I will ask your help. But at least to start with, I will tell my story and, uh, and see how it turns out. Now, when, when I got started on this business uh, in 1960 with my friend George Rosh, I just took it as it was, uh, a, a method for uh, taking raw scores and uh, turning them into measures. And it was useful and easy and uh, produced uh, uh, um, pleasing results. And I was satisfied with that. But as I talked about it more and more and more, I needed more and more of a reason for doing this. And so by and by, I got it embedded in an, a philosophy of science. So and now I always try to see it from that point of view, because I like to see myself involved in a wide process not scrutinizing a, a tiny thing on a desktop, uh, the before and after of which I have no uh, awareness of. So I start out with science is what? Exposure. All I mean by that is consciousness, awareness. Um, however, exposure by itself doesn't add up to anything. In fact, it's, it's gone as fast as it occurs. We have to t make a point of some kind and that leads us to observation. And so I, I find it very important to differentiate between exposure and observation uh, because it's at observation that not only science, but sanity begins. So I want to talk about that a little bit, although in a sense it has nothing to do with the Rosh model as such or with uh, algebra or, or anything like that. Observation is necessary in order to make measurements. Measurements are something we do with observations. So you might say, well, what's wrong with the observations? Why don't we just go directly from them to the analysis? Why do we need measurement in between? And I want to make a strong point of that. I hope I can make it clear to you why observation is necessary but not sufficient. And measurement, of course, can't be done without observation, but it is also necessary for analysis. And that, in fact, we don't do any analysis without doing some kind of measurement with our observations, whether it's explicit and well-controlled or just accidental and implicit. Now, after the measurements have been established, at this point, it's just one dimension, one thing at a time. Always a fiction, because nothing is one thing at a time in its fullness, but nothing to think about can be more than one thing at a time, otherwise we can't think about it clearly. So. Uh, one, measurement is one dimension at a time. Analysis is always more than one. It's always a comparison of two time points, of before and after, input and output, cause and effect, or a relationship between two different variables. So in a sense, you could say analysis is always multivariate, if you like to use that kind of word. But I prefer to think of it as comparisons and, and, uh, and, pro and the analysis of process, or cause and effect. Finally, uh, the reason for these activities, which are the machinery of science, is in order to think. And if you're a scientist, you call thinking theorizing. This elevates it to a somewhat higher plane. But I don't think there's anything uh, of, of substantial difference between ordinary everyday thinking and theory. Uh, perhaps theory is more carefully explained, or made more public, and so on. But it is the same thing as thinking. And these arrows indicate the relationships between these parts. Observation leads to measurement. And measurement goes back to the observations and suggests that some of them might be improved. So there is a circle here, a spiral, hopefully evolutionary, that is going up somewhere, in which these two activities feed each other, getting smarter and smarter about the situation that they are directed towards. Then, once you have measurement, you may do some analysis with it. But there is really very little of analysis can tell you about measurement and observation. If I look at the relationship between height 
and nutrition. There's very little I can find out from nutrition which will show me how to measure height. And there's very little I can find out about uh, measuring height which is going to help me with nutrition. So there isn't a feedback from analysis to measurement. That's important to realize because many statistical techniques offered to social scientists are based on the premise that somehow the analysis will tell you about the measurement. And it doesn't work. The measurement tells you about the observations in ways I hope we will, bec will become clear. But the analysis does not. The analysis uh, takes it for granted that you've got the measurements and that they're doing what you say they're doing and you're now looking at how they relate to each other. Theory, of course, <laughs> influences thinking, as it were, influences all of these things. So that's the basic process and the uh, mnemonic for it is ZOMAT. Observation begins by noticing. But noticing is not enough. We have to make something of the noticing. Say, we have to point. As soon as you point at something, you are nominating it for attention. And so it has, in the Stevens vernacular, S.S. Stevens vernacular, nominal status. It has become com something that you can uh, point to, so you can also choose it. And the utility of pointing is, uh, to facilitate choosing, and the motivation for choice is whether the uh, thing pointed at is pleasurable or painful. Uh, that's where it begins. Uh, very soon it becomes useful to name what you're pointing at so that you can tell yourself and others about what is a good choice and what is not. So the language of, 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 of pleasurable choosing depends uh, ultimately on being able to name what you've pointed at. So you give it a, a label of some kind. The label is maybe just a word, orange. See? Well, there's lots more to this than that word. But since I've discovered that oranges are pleasurable to eat, and uh, it's good, and I can point to them and say to myself, well, I'm going to eat one of those. And I found out it's good to eat. But if I want to tell Mike about it, it would be better to have a name for it and agree what the name points to. So we put it into language, and then it becomes recallable. This has left cortex activity now. And repeatable. That is, we can go and look for it, and a usable. And now we, we have uh, the, the kind of the development of this. This is perceptual, this is motor, you see. Having discovered that some things are pleasurable and some things painful, we uh, use our muscles, our cerebellum, uh, uh, skeletal, mus skeletal muscles and motility to either get the pleasure or avoid the pain. And I see that at the, that, that's the theory of observation. And an important thing to realize is that it is nominal and ordinal. That is, even in the observation, there's an order. Pleasure, pain, get, avoid. That is, they don't occur separately. Stevens gives them, says there are two things, but I think in the functioning of, in neurological functioning, if you name it, you, 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 have, you, you develop a choice about it. Or to put it another way, we don't spend much time naming things about which we have no choices. That's not, convi that's not efficient. And uh, once we know what's, what's pleasurable and painful, we generally, uh, uh, move ourselves to uh, negotiate those things. So it's nominal ordinal and it's qualitative. There's nothing yet really numerical about it. We haven't even started to count at this point. That's observation. Now when you get to be scientific, you, you, uh, you enhance this term with a model. When you say observation models, this means that you're going to define a certain situation, an item or an observation that you're going to make, a scientific observation like the gross national product of each country or the uh, uh, life expectancy of each country or uh, uh, how people answer a question, two plus three equals question mark. So you identify, this is the hook. You go out and hook something. Observation model is supposed to be a hook that hooks up stuff that you want. It identifies an indicative replication. Now, every one of those words is important. The pointing and naming is the identification. It's supposed to indicate something you're interested in. Some, some so like math items would indicate math ability. Uh, life expectancy would indicate longevity, perhaps quality of life consequences and things like that. Indicative and it has to be repeatable. If, you don't, if there's only one math question, you haven't got anything. You need many questions in math 
to replicate the single uh, searching idea, the line of inquiry, which is, which is mathematics in general. And as soon as you say this, you realize that these are indicative replications, but they're only examples. They're not the thing itself. They're only samples of the thing or examples of the thing. These define an observation format, which in its basic form looks like this. X is the data or the observation. What you're looking for either occurred or it didn't occur. Or maybe it occurred more than that, or more than that, or more than that. You could be counting something here that you had named. Or you could, this be, could be some kind of a rating scale. And each of these categories have two characteristics. They, they have, have to have labels of some kind and they have an ordinal structure. So now we have something which is qualitative, it's the same as before, qualitative, nominal, and ordinal, but it's still very concrete. It's something that happens or it doesn't happen, and after it's happened, it's happened and it's not happening again. It's a piece of history. So since what we always want to know about is what's next, this is never what we want to know about. But it's the only way we can infer what we want to know about. This is the past from which we're hoping to see the present and the future. Let's forget the present for a moment. And uh, so while it, while it isn't what we want, it's the only way to get there. And we have, that's a very important thing to realize. I don't want to know which questions you answered. I want to know how much math you knew. But I can only find out by asking you some questions. So I have to find a way to make that leap from what I know but don't want to what I want but can't know. That's called inference. Now, here are some examples of observation models. No and yes, very simple. I've, I've identified a quality, and I can ask, is it there or isn't it? Or right and wrong. I have some kind of a question, and I have an answer I expect which I call the right answer, and if it doesn't occur, whatever else occurs is called the wrong answer. There could be more than one right answer and more than one wrong answer, but basically whatever happens, I either say right or wrong, or absent present. One step, X has two categories, but just one step, the categories are always ordered. Now here's a three, here's a two-step one. Three category, two step. Frown, uh, non, non-responsive and smile, or a little, some, and a lot, you see? And the important thing is these are proceeding in the direction of each time. But I'm not taking any statement about how big a step it is from a smile to a, a, a non-response, or from a non-response to a, I mean, from a frown to a smile, or how far it is from a little to some, or from some to a lot. Those are things that I uh, will find out later. That's to be done later on. I want to know those things, but I don't, at this point, I don't take a stand on it. All I say is that this is more than that, and this is more than that. Some is more than a little, a lot is more than some. And we can go to three steps, four categories. Strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, a very popular one. Never, sometimes, often, always, and on and on and on. But these could also be, think of it, if you could go further, these could actually be the life expectancies for each of the uh, 72 countries in Pedro's data, in which case they might be ordered in 70, 72 steps. It might be that every country has a different life expectancy, and I can go from the lowest to the highest, and there are 72 distinct uh, values for the data. However, right now I realize I don't want all 72. That's too many steps. So as we move into this, we start to realize that it isn't better to have lots and lots of steps in the data. What you want to find out is the fewest number of steps that will do the job you want. Uh, you know that if you ask a person to differentiate on a 100-point scale the sweetness of this orange, that you're going to get lots of nonsense. Now, on a, maybe a 5-point scale, you can get some winners, but not, probably not any more than that. So you need one of the things you learn as you construct the measures from the observation models is you learn from the measure analysis what, how many steps in the observation model are productive? Uh, two or three, four perhaps, usually are pretty productive. In most tasks involving human judgment, uh, it's, it's very hard to discover any evidence that more than four or five steps, that is five or six categories, 
are producing anything but noise. And the, fortunately, the mathematical analysis of the data allows you to dif just to discern what is noise and what is informative. So that's what that, those arrows going back and forth between measurement and observation were about. Now that's the measurement will tell you how to modify your observation models so that they are more productive for you, take less time, are more accurate, provoke less confusion, and so on. Uh, an odd number of categories producing a middle, like for three or five, can often be difficult because many people will pick this center thing in order not to answer the question. So you won't know whether they really mean halfway or whether they mean no dice. And that, will, uh, that, that elicits from your respondents an ambiguity which you can't untangle. So in general, it's better to have an even number of categories if the categories are being addressed by a respondent so that they won't duck out by going through the middle. And uh, it's also, for, by the same token, you don't want to ha offer them uh, a something to circle which says not applicable. Because if, if you're asking them questions that don't apply, then you shouldn't be asking them the questions. But if you ask them the questions and they do apply, then you shouldn't give them a chance to refuse to respond. That isn't productive. And you need to learn, in fact, if in, you have asked a question which people don't like to respond to, uh, you can learn by the confusion that occurs when they respond to that item from the, from the uh, chaos in their responses. So you don't need to give them the non-applicable category. Yeah. Measurement. If you'll remember, I guess I should, uh, I should uh, put up the, uh, the code word here, well, at least the middle part of it. O, M, and A, and we were just talking about how the observation model, uh, while motivated uh, uh, prior to the measurement, can be uh, informed and improved by the uh, measurement analysis. So measurement is the yardstick. And whenever you're working with a measurement problem, don't hesitate to go back to yardsticks and make sure that the question you're asking could be answered with a yardstick. Because if it can't be answered with a yardstick, you're not going to be able to answer it. You may be able to fake it and fool people, but you won't. This is what measurement is. And if you can't make whatever you're doing into to behave like a yardstick, you haven't made a measurement yet. Now, the interesting thing is, almost everything sensible can be made into yardsticks. It's amazing how many yardsticks can be made from data which people throw up their hands and say, well, this is just too many different things. I can't possibly understand this. I mean, in Pedro's case, why would you think that, that uh, uh, life expectancy, uh, literacy rate, and gross national product would measure the same things over 72 countries? Uh, why? And yet, his analysis shows that they can be taken to do that and that this measuring the same thing for them is, in fact, very informative about the country. So uh, uh, instead of deciding on the basis of some religion you, you suffer from, it's better to do the experiment and see what happens, and the analysis will tell you. And this, this brings up something else about measurement models. Not only do they have to be very simple and very clear, but they have to be very demanding. They should demand what you're looking for, so that if it's not there, you learn right away from the analysis, because the model objects, and it says, this is not what you're looking for. Do something about it. You don't want models that are generous and permissive and just will let any, any old thing happen because then you'll keep cooking garbage and you'll never know how to make a really good pot of soup. You want a tight recipe that says you only put in potatoes and onions, no shoes, no rotten fruit, and so on and so forth. That's what you want. Now, so measurement's the yardstick. Counts, observed replications. That's what it does exchanges the observed data x for inferred meaning probability of x. Now that's a terrific trick here. And that's where meaning ev evolves. Why don't you sit here, Marge? You can see better. You, know what, you want the heat? You like my sweater? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> OK. Uh, we have x. We want what it means. How do we get there? By constructing a probability for x to occur which we hope will, will hold up in the future. If we can use our experience with x to construct probabilities of x, then perhaps later on, 
because of the general continuity that we've observed and experienced, things kind of stay the way that we found them as time passes, uh, we'll be able to use the probability of x to predict what's going to happen. And for example, here, I can flip this coin on and on and on and get all kinds of heads and tails as I move along, and I will have a history of heads and tails for this coin. But when I'm going to use it to decide who gets the pie, uh, that history is no use to me because we're going to flip right now, Kathy and I, and see who gets the pie. Well, why would she let me do that, you see? Only because she believes that the meaning of all those heads and tails are, or is, that there's a half a chance for a head and a half a chance for a tail. So when I flip it, she has just as good a chance as I do to get the pie, and you do. See, so there it is. So you can see this is a very reliable method because you, it helps you get what you want. So we have to bridge this gap. And the big mistake made in many of the semi-sciences is they mistake this for the measure. They mistake this for what they should be doing statistics to. And it isn't. It's all you got, but it isn't what you want. And you have to find a way to turn it into that. Just like coin flips are done. The probability theory was devised for this purpose. Uh, uh, the Bernoullis and the Others who developed these uh, ideas 300 years ago were uh, being hired by gamblers and, uh, t uh, and traders who were sending ships out and wanted insurance uh, to figure out uh, how much uh, they should gamble or what, gam what were good gambles or how much they sh the insurance company should charge to insure the, the uh, cargo. And they had to use well, uh, the history, which was X, to forecast the future, which is the P of X in such a way that the forecast would turn out to be useful on subsequent applications. And the basic uh, uh, theory we'll use is the binomial theorem. And you know the binomial theorem. Wh who was the uh, originator of the binomial theorem, Mike? Do you remember? Was it? It was Daniel Bernoulli. Daniel Bernoulli. Oops. Well, we're very grateful to him because lots of things follow from that. You have the probability that x equals 1, and you have the probability that x equals 0, and those are the only two values. And so the expected value of x would be the sum of the two values of x, each one times x. So that would be x0 times p0 plus uh, x1 times p1. But since that's 0, that falls out, and since that's 1, that falls out. So p x equals 1 turns out to be the expected value of x. And by further very simple uh, maneuvers, you learn that the variance of x, and so quite often uh, they just remove all of this and just talk about this is the probability of x, meaning x equals 1, and the probability of x not being 1 is the difference between 1 and the probability of x. And uh, that's, that's the payoff of the binomial uh, distribution. And we will use this a lot in our work, because basically x is like a binomial distribution. And our approach to x through p of x will be thanks to Daniel Bernoulli. And we'll be interested in what we expect x to be, which is its probability of occurring, and what we think the variance of that expectation is, which is the product of its probability of occurring times its probability of not occurring. So this will come up again, and that is the entire machinery out of which all the rest is built. The, uh, uh, the, the only difference is when x has more than two values, you use a multinomial version of this instead of the binomial. But there's nothing uh, basically different about it. It's a little more complicated algebraically, but the idea is already there, and it's just being extended. So we're coming down here now. We've reached this far. And this p of x must do something for us. It must define a line of inquiry, which is calibrated by the agents of measurement, the questions we ask, and which will position a measure for the object we're measuring, let's say a person, on the line of inquiry. So the measurement model has got to take x and go through p of x to get b and d, calibrating the agents d so this and locating the objects b. This line has to be a yardstick. That is, it has to have equal units, and it has to have a, a useful origin somewhere along it. 
We have to put a zero on there, and we have to be able to count up equal units. And when we get done with this, we have something which is quantitative, interval, and ratio. They're the same thing. And abstract. Remember, previously, with the observation models, we said they were concrete. They are palpable, but they're over. They're obsolete. This is abstract. It's eternal, but it's not palpable. We can think it. We can make it, we can, we can represent it. But you see, this is a representation of the idea of equal units with an origin right here. But these units are not actually equal. Anybody with a careful distance measuring device can convince, can convince anybody else that this ruler, in fact, is very uneven if you look closely enough at it. So we realize now that the idea is perfect, but the representation is never perfect. No representation, nothing palpable is ever a perfect representation of the idea that motivates it and by which it is used. So we have to keep that in the background as we proceed. There is an asymmetry between these two things. The object can be as complicated as it wants to be. Like my height, like I'm relatively complicated, but my height is not complicated. My height is very simple. Bing, bing. These inches here are the items by which I measure my height. And if you want to make it into a test, you get this stick longer, and then you see which, inch, which, which items I pass. Those are the inches below me. And which items I fail, those are the inches above me. And where my hair is, it's not quite clear, so there's a certain amount of uncertainty in this region. And you can score me on this test. And after you decide about where the... Uh, average uh, confusion is along here, you can say, well, we'll call that Ben's height, and that will be some inches on this, on this ruler, and then you will call that my height. But it will be a fiction uh, produced by the, the construction of this device and its very careful application in a certain way. If you did it like this, I would get much taller, you see, or if you started up here, I would get shorter. So you have to be, there are rules for how you use these things, and if you don't, obey, if you don't follow the rules, you won't get useful results. So uh, what that means is that anybody can ruin a Mercedes by driving it into the lake. But that doesn't prove it's a bad Mercedes or that Mercedes is a bad car, that Mercedes don't work that way. And it's the same thing with, for example, um, a mathematics test. You can give a mathematics test in such a way as to ruin it, like put a time limit on it, uh, which is too short, and that'll ruin it. Or print it in a language that the people who are taking it don't speak. In a lot of ways, and that's, that's not just a joke, because if you use very fancy English and you give it to children who don't speak fancy English, you may not find out how much math they know, because they can't read the question. So, uh, and that isn't nearly as well watched after as you might expect it to be. But it's a little bit like measuring height this way instead of that way. So one of the things we need to work on is to make the rules for a sensible uh, application of a measuring device as clear as possible or as obvious as possible so that we won't confuse ourselves when we get to the analysis stage and be analyzing numbers that don't work right. Somebody might still argue that why couldn't we just count the things and use that? And I would say, well, okay, here we've got two oranges. Do you care which one I give you? Why? They're just oranges, one, two, I have five of these and five of those. Could I trade five of these for five of those? Would you make the trade? Why not? Because while these are oranges, they're not, what? The same size. Well, why do you care about that? Well, the oranges are never the same size. Well, so now what are we, how are we going to do business? This, this, this uh, reveals something to you, that measurement began not in science, but in commerce. The scientists had no motivation for measurement that was natural, but the traders had a very urgent one. They wanted to make money, and they wanted people to trade with them. You can't get a trade going unless both sides think it's a fair deal which means you have to have units that will work in that, in that system. Bushel baskets might work, but then you've got to watch out what if they're different sizes. So weight is even better. But as we move from bushel baskets, which are semi-fiction, to weight, which is a complete fiction, we realize to get the equity essential for commerce and trade, we have to go to abstract units and to machines like this, which maintain them well enough so everybody's satisfied, you see. And it has to be both parties that are satisfied. So whatever defect the device has to have, they can't be biased or prejudicial. They can't favor one side 